Lord. Now, it's that time of the year, isn't it? It's the time of the year that we consider things that we may need to change. It's the time of the year that we start talking about this thing called New Year's resolution. And I feel like this service between Christmas and New Year's always has to deal with New Year's resolution. I wonder, have you ever made New Year's resolutions? <laughs> now, here's the question. Have you ever kept them? Right? That's, that's, a, that's a trickier question. So as I was thinking about our word for today, I began thinking, um, what if Jesus made New Year's resolutions? What, what would his resolutions be about? The Bible actually helps us know, not that Jesus has to renew his resolutions every year, but the Bible actually helps us know what Jesus' mission is. And Jesus was always resolved to accomplish his mission. That, that is why he came, right? We just celebrated Christmas. Christmas. That is why Jesus came. He came as a man on a mission, as a man who is resolved. But what is Jesus' mission? Well, some would answer this question by saying that Jesus came to teach us how to live moral lives. And there's truth in that. Right? Je Jesus, Jesus does call us to walk in holiness. But, but I, think, I think Jesus' mission is even deeper than that. Some may say that Jesus came to show us that the power of the supernatural is available. Right? He was a miracle worker. And, and he would show us that by the power of the Spirit, we could accomplish things that we would think were impossible. And that is, there's truth to that, right? But even Jesus' miracles pointed beyond themselves. Others may, may suggest that Jesus came to set an example for us to follow. There's truth to that as well, isn't that? That's what Pastor Andrew was teaching us last week as we looked at Philippians 2, that we should have the mind of Christ. But before we can live moral lives, before we live in the power of the Holy Spirit, before we can follow the example of Jesus, we have a great problem that needs to be overcome. By nature, we're lost Away from God, by nature, we do not seek God. And therefore, we cannot receive the benefits of being united with God. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says this, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. When, when the Bible uses this inclusive language, it uses the inclusive language on purpose. No exceptions. Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3 says this, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of men, us, to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good. Not even one. So the Bible's verdict is clear concerning all of us. Apart from the intervention of Christ, we are lost. Apart from the intervening work of Christ in the sight of God, we cannot live moral lives. We cannot live in the power of the Spirit. We cannot follow the example of Christ. Apart from the intervening work of God, we are unable to find our way to him. And this is where Jesus' mission on earth meets us. Jesus' mission, if Jesus had a New Year's resolution, it would be to seek 
and save the lost. Jesus was a man on a mission who sought after the lost at all times. I'm sure even today, some of us are considering committing to New Year's resolutions, right? Uh, that is not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, don't hear me say that. But a few years ago, I made one resolution and I have kept it ever since. Here's what it is. Resolved. Never to do New Year's resolution again. <laughs> and I have kept that promise. Gyms, gyms are often full on January 1st and empty on February 1st, aren't they? The first few chapters of Genesis often get read, right? But who gets to Exodus, right? Changes in diets, right? Pizza is bad January 1st, great option February 1st. Is that how it works? You see, friends, resolution without transformation never lasts. Resolutions without transformation never last. Jesus didn't come to help us accomplish a few New Year's resolutions so we could better ourselves. So we can be better than we were last year or so that we can be better, a little bit better than those around us. Jesus didn't come to bring about superficial change or moralistic modifications to our behaviors. And you can feel this in. Jesus came to give us a deep internal and lasting heart transformation. Jesus is in the business of transforming, not conforming. Friends, the reality is that we all need to change. We all need resolutions. If you're not a believer among us and you're visiting us, we, we love that you are here. We love that you have come to be with us. You could not be at a better place. Perhaps you came to our Christmas Eve service and, and you're enticed by the community. You're enticed by the message. <laughs> Friends, we want you to know that you need the radical change that Jesus brings about of abandoning all trust that you have in yourself to be at peace with God. Only Jesus can bring about that change. Friend, if you do not know Christ, you're about to hear the most important words you could possibly hear. Believers also need to change, don't we? We, we don't look at unbelievers as though we are innately better. We are but beggars who tell other beggars to find where to find bread. We're growing from one degree of glory to another. We are working out our salvation. We are laying aside the sin that clings so closely. The gospel is both for believers and for non-believers because it is through the gospel that we come in contact with Jesus Christ and it is only by coming in contact with Jesus Christ that we truly change this is what we see in our text today a man a sinner named Zacchaeus right do you know the song Zacchaeus was a wee little man a wee little man was he Right. I thought about singing it, but I'm going to spare you. <laughs> but we know this story so well, don't we? Our children grow up singing about this. And that's a good thing because we need to see true transformation. And Zacchaeus was a sinner who met the Savior, Jesus Christ. And by encountering the Savior, he was deeply transformed. So if you have your Bibles in front of you, or if you have the outline, would you look at the text? We're going to look at Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. 
Jesus is in the pilgrimage. He's going towards Jerusalem. He has many encounters and many teachings. The story that we're about to read probably lasted several hours, if not a few days. But Luke summarizes it to us wonderfully well in 10 verses as Jesus meets Zacchaeus. So the text says, He entered, that is Jesus, Jericho, and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was, a, he was small in stature. So he ran. He ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they grumbled. The crowd there is. He has gone into the guest to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. So we're going to break down this passage in scenes, okay? So we're going to look at different scenes happening throughout these accounts. So as we look at the first four verses, we're going to see this. We're going to see the inquisitive Zacchaeus. The inquisitive Zacchaeus. We see in verse 1 that, that Jesus is entering the city of Jericho. This is his last major city before he enters Jerusalem to die. This is the same city as the city in the book of Joshua, right? But this Jericho was nothing like the Jericho of Joshua. The walls were rebuilt. The city was thriving. The Romans had invested in this city. Aqueducts everywhere. Trading routes everywhere. Money flowing left and right. Jericho was a tax collector's paradise. In verse 2, we meet not only a tax collector, but a chief tax collector from Jericho, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, but he was rich. His wealth was likely not gained through honest hard work, but he likely advanced in the rankings of being a tax collector by being more crooked than the others. His fame among the folks of Jericho was that of a sinner. Tax collectors in the first century were, were Jews who sold themselves to the filthy Roman government and, and became rich by extorting money from their fellow Jews. You see, it's, it's, like, it's like a country overtakes your country and your fellow citizens turn on you. In the New Testament, there were sinners, and then there were tax collector sinners. In verse 3, we see clearly that Zacchaeus knew about Jesus. We, we don't know how much he knew about him, but, but he was curious enough that he ran and climbed a tree to see Jesus. Perhaps he had heard of this wonderful man who had just raised a man from the dead. 
Perhaps he had heard of his fame. He was a friend of sinners and tax collectors. You see, Zacchaeus, as a tax collector, was not allowed into the temple. He was not allowed into the presence of God. But he heard of this man who knew God and welcomed sinners. But he has two problems, right? Too many people, not enough height. A man of short stature and too many people trying to see Jesus. So in verse 4, he abandons his class. He runs and climbs a sycamore tree. A sycamore tree is kind of like a, like a short oak tree. Stocky, branchy, easy to climb. Now picture this. A fully grown, wealthy, Middle Eastern man. Probably wearing fancy garments. Running and climbing trees like a little boy. Why? Verse, te- verse 3 tells us, because he was seeking to see Jesus. There's a physical reality right here. Uh, uh, he, his height, the crowd, those things kept him from seeing Jesus. But there is also a spiritual reality that seems to run across the Gospels that cannot be ignored here. If he could just see Jesus as he is, his life would change. We see that happening throughout the Gospels, don't we? There is, a, there is another account in the Gospel of Mark about a man called Bartimaeus. He was a blind man and he calls on Jesus, son of David. And the crowd again tries to keep him from seeing Jesus. But Jesus calls him and he comes to Jesus and Jesus asks him, what do you want from me? And the blind Bartimaeus says, Lord, cause me to see again. Jesus heals him and tells him, your faith has saved you. I think it's very relevant that we know these two men. I think it's very relevant that the Bible actually gives us their names, Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus. One rich, one poor. One having all things, the other having nothing but a cloak. One rejected by his physical impairments, the other for his illicit wealth. Neither one could see Jesus. Friends, my prayer to you today is that you would be able to see Jesus. Not not just by climbing on a physical tree, but that you would be able to see Jesus in his word. How do we see Jesus today? We see Jesus today through the preaching of his word. That is what the Bible tells us. It is through the eyes of faith. Isn't it? It is through the sharing of the gospel. Listen to what Paul tells the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 4, verses 4 through 5. The God of this world, that is Satan, has blinded the eyes. No. He has blinded the minds. How do you see with your mind? The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. How do we see the gospel today? We see the gospel today when our minds are able to see Jesus proclaimed. Look at what Paul goes on to say. They're they're kept from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God for what we proclaim. This is the same word for preaching. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. So friends, the preaching of the word is how Christ is displayed to us today. The Galatians 
saw Christ crucified. How? Through the preaching of the gospel. This is why we seek to prioritize the preaching of the word at Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. We should be as eager to hear the preached word Sunday after Sunday as Zacchaeus was eager to run and climb on a tree to see Jesus. You want to see Jesus? Sit under faithful preaching of the word. After all, this is what sanctifies us, is it not? This is what changes us. It is, it is seeing Christ for who he is. Today, through the preaching of his word. But when he returns, John tells us, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Why? Because we shall see him as he is. Today we walk by faith. Tomorrow we will walk by sight. So friends, can I challenge you to prioritize the Sunday morning gathering? Don't be late. You know that the whole 1042 deal? It's to help you. Our services start at 1042. No, they don't. But if you show up at 1042, you will be ready for the opening reading of the scripture. You will be ready to be gathered around the preached word of God. Can I encourage you to prioritize Sunday morning gathering more highly than anything else you could do? Do you truly believe that the greatest need you have is to behold Christ? To see him like Bartimaeus saw him, like Zacchaeus saw him, then friends, let us not neglect gathering together. Parents, can I challenge you to teach your children that Sunday is the Lord's day? Can I challenge you to not accept or schedule competing activities when Christ is being publicly portrayed here in this house? Your children will not be saved by their soccer skills or by their Disney getaways. Your children will be saved by seeing Christ. Christ proclaimed to them. God says to the prophet Isaiah, look to me and be saved. So we meet, we meet Zacchaeus, the sinner. But now we meet Jesus, the Savior. And we see here the attentive Jesus. The attentive Jesus. You know, I remember once going to buy milk with my brother at a grocery store. And we were talking to each other. And we literally lapped around the grocery store three times before we found the milk. I'm not very attentive, right? Drives my wife crazy because she's a woman on a mission, right? I'm not very attentive and neither is my brother. You put us together, it's pretty bad, right? But that's not how Jesus walks around, right? Jesus walks around knowing what his mission is. He is attentive. Friends, there is a sense in which Jesus is the savior of the whole world, and that is glorious, and we should praise him for that. This does not mean everyone will go to heaven, but it means that salvation is accessible to all peoples. But listen to this and fill this in. But the broadness of Jesus' salvation does not keep it from being personal. Jesus is walking towards the cross to give his life for all. But he sees Zacchaeus. Do you know someone so well that you can spot them in a crowd instantly? Right? The other day, I was, sitting, I was sitting here in this church, and I heard footsteps. And I said, that's my wife. And guess what? It was. I know her so well, I can identify her by the way she walks. Right? And, and 
the reason why I can identify her is because I love her so much and I care about her so much that I'm always attentive to her. It is more special when she comes into this room, sorry guys, for me, than when any of you come into this room. <laughs> she is special to me. I can spot her among many people. Isn't this what Jesus does? This is what Jesus does. He spots him because to Jesus, Zacchaeus is special. To Jesus, Zacchaeus mattered. To society, Zacchaeus was an outcast, but to Jesus, Zacchaeus was a sinful man who needed to be transformed. Look at verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Here is Jesus, this greater than life figure. You know him, but you're sure he does not know you. He approaches you and calls you by name. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. This is how Jesus spots the sinner. He zooms in. When Jesus grabs a hold of you, he does so by revealing himself directly to you. Zacchaeus thought that he was seeking Jesus, but it was Jesus who was seeking Zacchaeus all along. Amen. Verse 5, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. This is a divine appointment. Jesus is not asking Zacchaeus if he can stay, right? Do you see that? He is not asking, hey, do you mind? He's saying, I must. I must stay with you today. He is telling Zacchaeus he's staying at his house. We have often been given a picture of Jesus who is just hoping we would come to him. Oh, Jesus is so lonely. Oh, Jesus is bored in heaven, so he came down, brought heaven down to us. Once you come to him, don't make Jesus sad. No, friends. Jesus is a man on a mission. He is not coming to Zacchaeus because he's incomplete without him. He's coming to Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus is incomplete without Jesus. He is seeking after the lost. Jesus is not after us because he is lonely. He is after us because we need him. Amen. We desperately need him. And if he did not seek after us, we would never come to him. What a glorious Savior we have. Amen. Now let me bring your attention to this little word here in verse 5. The word is must. Zacchaeus hurry down, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. This is a word that is often used in the gospel of Luke. And we see this word highlighting Jesus' mission. In Luke 4, 43, Jesus says, But he said to them, I must preach the, gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Jesus' purpose. He must preach the gospel. Luke 9, 22, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Luke 17, 25. But first, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Luke 22, 37. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for what is written about me has its fulfillment. Luke 24, 7. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Luke 22, Luke 24, verse 44. Then he said to them, there are, 
These are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus uses this word intentionally to tell us what his mission is. To come, preach the gospel, die, and be raised on our behalf. And here in verse 5, we see this, ver this word directed to one person. The salvation of Zacchaeus is his mission. The cross is Jesus' mission. But so is Zacchaeus. And friend, so are you. So are you. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. Zacchaeus is an unlikely convert. He's not religious. He's not pious. Although his Hebrew name means pure, he is not pure. He's a bad candidate to become friends with Jesus. But the good news for Zacchaeus and the good news for each one of us is that Jesus is known as the friend of sinners. Isaiah 65 one says, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. Although Jesus is here speaking of the Gentiles, he's saying that Jesus comes to the most unlikely people. Jesus came to give hope to those who have no hope of acceptance. To those that are delusioned with religion. To those who do not have a good reputation. Or to those who did not measure up. Did any of these things describe you in any way? It describes all of us, doesn't it? And here's the beautiful thing. The requirement for Jesus to seek after us is that we must be lost. Jesus seeks after the lost. He does not require spiritual fitness from us. He says, come and I'll change you. He doesn't require for us to change, to come to him. So friend, perhaps you're sitting here today and you're saying, this whole church thing sounds wonderful, but I look around and every family here looks perfect. And I don't. Can I just suggest to you, get to know us. You may be surprised at how, at how dysfunction we can be sometimes. <laughs> well, I hope that you would identify that we walk by faith in the grace that God gives, right? It's a beautiful thing to see sinners Walking in the grace of God, isn't it? Friends, if you feel inadequate, if you feel that, that God cannot accept you, if you feel like you could never come to God, you've met the requirements. Jesus can seek you. You see, the good news of the gospel, the good news that Jesus came to proclaim starts with the bad news. That we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And no one can come to God because our sins have made a separation between us and our God. But the good news does not stop here. The good news is that God has made a way through his son Jesus Christ. You see that it was not Zacchaeus ultimately that sought Jesus. It was Jesus that sought Zacchaeus. And when Jesus seeks you, he finds you and he brings you back. So it is not your fitness that is required. It is the fitness of Christ and he is perfectly fit. So you may ask, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to have a relationship with God? What must I do to be given eternal life? What must I do to be forgiven of my sins? And the word of God would say to you, believe 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent from your sins and forsake them. And let the love of Christ compel you and change you. In verse 6, we see this beautiful response. The response that I've been praying that you would give today to this word. The sinless Savior meets the sinful man. Zacchaeus hurried and came down. And he received Jesus joyfully. This is why the Apostle John tells us we love today because... He first loved us. Now we have met, we have met Zacchaeus, we have met Jesus. Now we're going to meet the jealous crowd. In verse 7, we read, And when they, there's a crowd, when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. The crowd witnessing Jesus' interaction with Zacchaeus, instead of rejoicing that Jesus' mercy was on full display, they grumbled. You see, when we resent that God is kind towards someone, can be an indication that we have not received the kindness of God. When we look at others, and we do not wish they will come to Christ? Could be an indication that we have not experienced godly changing grace. Friends, because those who receive grace give grace. Those who are forgiven forgive. That is how the Christian life works. Grumbling is a serious sin in the Bible, isn't it? A sin that we must stay clear of. Adam grumbled at God for the wife he gave him. Israel grumbled at God for his provision of water and food. Job's wife grumbled at God for his hard providence. Jonah grumbled at God because he showed mercy towards the Ninevites. Grumbling is a serious sin because... Feel this in. Grumbling reveals a heart that is dissatisfied with the Lord. A grumbling heart says, God is not a good provider. God is not satisfied. What, why doesn't God give me what I want? Ultimately, grumbling reveals the unbelieving heart. Hebrews 3 lists all of the sins, many of the sins of Israel in the wilderness. And then in verse 19, it summarizes the sins by saying, they were unable to enter, there is the promised land, the land of rest, because of unbelief. They did not believe God was good. God was for them. We see a crowd that is dissatisfied that the Lord is merciful towards a sinner. How unfathomable. Friends, those who have experienced mercy rejoice at the sight of mercy. So perhaps it's good for us to stop for a second and examine our own selves so that we may grow. So that we may fight the sin of grumbling against God. So how can we examine our hearts to make sure that we don't have a grumbling heart? So here are some ways that I thought would be helpful. Are we thankful to God for his salvation? Is that part of our prayers? Is that part of why we give thanks to God? Or do we only give thanks to God for physical things when we do receive them? Do we rejoice when others come to know Christ? You know, I often feel so moved when I see someone be baptized. It's such a moving thing to see someone proclaim Christ publicly. 
Do we rejoice when others come to know Christ? Do we view God's provision as a blessing? Or are we dissatisfied with what God has given us? Do you realize that both those things that you see as blessings and those things that you see as trials come from the Lord? Do you rejoice in your suffering, as Paul tells the Romans? I received a letter from a friend just yesterday who has battled an autoimmune disease for over 10 years. And in his letter, he wished Indy and I that we would experience God's blessings this year. But then he said something that was so insightful. He said, and I pray that you are able to recognize God's blessings. You know why he was saying that? Because he recognizes his illness as a blessing from God. He recognizes the Lord is working in him, shaping him. His eyes are not in this world. His eyes are in the world to come. He knows that if he perseveres, he will win the crowd of life. The crown of life. Finally, do we think of ourselves as more deserving of God's grace than others? Do we look around and think, I can see why God saved me? That's what the crowd is doing here, isn't it? Him? Why would he save him? I can see why you saved me. But he is beyond. This verse is both an encouragement but also a warning for us. It's an encouragement for us because we know that if Christ is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. You know, we see, we're going to see Zacchaeus' response, and his, his response is completely unfazed by the grumbling. It's better to be with Christ and no one else than to be with the whole world, but not with Christ. But we also reminded that we can easily fall into the entrapment of a grumbling heart when we think too highly of ourselves. The Bible tells us to think of ourselves with a sober mind. Paul tells the Philippians, do all things without grumbling or disputing. So we've met Jesus, we've met Zacchaeus, we've met the crowd. Now let us see how Zacchaeus' life is transformed. So we meet now in verse 8, the transformed Zacchaeus. Now, now it's interesting, Luke does not tell us anything about how Zacchaeus or Jesus reacted to the crowd. And I think he's doing this on purpose. I think he's displaying to us what Zacchaeus is really concerned about. Throughout this story, Zacchaeus seems to only be concerned about Jesus. He doesn't care that he's running around climbing on a tree as a rich Middle Eastern man. He doesn't care about what the crowd is grumbling about. He cares that he is interacting with Jesus. That to him is more important. In the in, it's interesting because this displays us what the encounter with Jesus brings about in Zacchaeus. It does what every encounter with Jesus should do. It transforms. Every encounter with Christ transforms the sinner. People love to point out that Jesus was always surrounded by sinners. And that is true and that is awesome. We were able to come to him because of that. But whenever Jesus spent time with a sinner, the sinner walked away transformed. Jesus does not condone sin. Jesus does not look at a sinner and say, go and continue in your sins. Instead, he says, go and sin no more. Jesus did not associate, you can feel this in, Jesus did not associate with sinners to approve of their sins. 
but to set them free from their bondage to sin. In verse 8, we see this radical transformation. Verse 8 says this, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, the Lord, behold, the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Zacchaeus was not required by the law of Moses to do these things. There was no requirement to share half of his wealth with the poor. And Leviticus 5 tells us that if he defrauded anyone and he was able to pay it back, all that he needed to do was pay it back and add one-fifth of what he kept. What law was Zacchaeus submitting himself to? Why was he going above and beyond? It sounded like this crooked tax collector became, after his encounter with Jesus, a generous, sacrificial, joyous giver. Zacchaeus is not submitting himself to a law, but he was acting out of a transformed heart. This is the new covenant promise happening here right in front of us, right? I will remove your heart of flesh, a heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. This is a transformed heart. It was not the law that changed him. It was Jesus. Zacchaeus is submitting himself to what the New Testament calls the law of Christ, the law of love. When you love Christ, you seek to be like him. This is what it means to not be under the law, but under grace. The law has no power to change our hearts. It simply shows us where we're wrong. But grace, grace changes us. Friends, what sinners, what, 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 this is what it means to be changed by Christ. What, what sins must you put to death? What must you change in your life? Where is growth necessary? To overcome these, you don't need laws or resolutions. Right here, the Beatles got it right. All you need is love. I'm not, I'm not uh, recommending the whole song. But that line is right, right? All you need is love. You need to be so compelled by the love of Christ that your greatest desire must not be to fulfill your desires, but to fulfill His desire. When you love Christ so much, you begin looking like Him, right? You know, when, when Inzi was pregnant, I was really hoping Boaz would come out like me. And when he came out, he looked like me. What a wonderful thing. And, and, and Inzi and I are often talking, you know, sometimes she thinks, oh, he kind of looks like me. And I say, no, he looks like me. Right? Uh, and and uh, she's like, oh, his eyes. Yeah, okay, you can take the eyes. I take the rest. Yeah. <laughs> It is such a joy to see that your son looks like you, right? I want him to, to look like me because I want to identify with him so much. In a spiritual way, this is what God calls us to do. God calls us to love Jesus so much that we start looking like him, resembling him. Friends, this is the motivation for sanctification, the motivation for sanctification is loving Christ. If you love him, what will you do? You will obey his commandments. So as Christians, we don't seek moralistic transforma uh, changes. We seek deep spiritual transformations. It's not just the behavior that ought to change. It's the affections of our hearts. Do you want to change? Love Jesus more. 
Do you want to be transformed? Love him more. We just saw the transformed Zacchaeus. But now we're going to see, finally, the missional Jesus. Look at verse 9. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to his house, since he also is the son of Abraham. This is an interesting statement. Jesus sees the transformed heart and says that Zacchaeus has been saved. He sees the fruit that gives evidence of a godly root. Friends, the gospel that saves you changes you. Jesus is not saying that Zacchaeus' works have saved him. But he is saying the evidence that he's changed is that his works are good. The gospel that saves you changes you. The grace that saves empowers. Faith that is alive works. Jesus declares him a son of Abraham. He was already a Jew before the encounter. But now not only is he a child of Abraham by birth. He is a child of Abraham by faith. In verse 10 Jesus says... For the Son of Man, Jesus' favorite title. Yes, it speaks of his humanity, the Son of Man, but it's also a title, right, that we, th th that we hear in the book of Daniel about the Messiah. The Messiah would come like the Son of Man, riding on the clouds. For the Son of Man, God's sent one, God's chosen one came for what purpose? To seek and to save the lost. This is the mission of Jesus. He seeks, he finds, he saves. He seeks, he grabs a hold of you, and he transforms. This is why he came. He came to seek and to save and he came to seek and save you I love the old hymn that says there is no other argument there is no other plea it is enough that Jesus died do you know this hymn and that he died for me it is interesting that in chapter 18 of Luke we meet another rich person the rich young ruler. We don't know his name. He was a young man. He was religious. He was pious. He was pure in earthly standards. But he loved money more than Jesus. He was not able to let go, break his idolatry, and follow Christ. Here we meet Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus' name means Pure, but he was not pure. He was not religious. He was not pious. But Zacchaeus was made pure because he loved Jesus more than he loved money. Friends, it is Jesus who transforms. It is Jesus who changes. It is Jesus who makes us pure. Is Jesus seeking you today? Have you seen Jesus in the new light today? Has, have these words in any way challenged you so that you can climb on your sycamore tree and seek to see Christ? Is he calling you so that you may love him more than yourself and your things? Is Jesus saying, I don't want you to be resolved for one year. I want you to be transformed for eternity. Friends, apart from Christ, we are lost and headed to eternal condemnation. But when Jesus finds us, everything changes. 
So let me ask you this question today. Have you been found? Let's pray.